Yeah. All right. Uh, this is Mark Brickler, and I want to welcome you to this podcast, which is going to be with both me and Dr. Carl Lehman, uh, who is a new friend of mine. We are very thrilled to have met each other just in the last couple of months. We already did do one podcast together uh, on hearing God's voice. So this is our second podcast. Uh, uh, Dr. Carl, would you say hello to us all? <clears throat> hey, greetings, folks. I mean, my people will probably be seeing this, but also especially to all of Mark Berkler's people, the folks who've been following his writing and reading and teaching and doing his two-way journaling. I'm glad to be meeting you through, through Dr. Mark. Amen, amen. Well, I'm looking forward to sharing, to sharing this with all of my people. And I'm gonna go ahead and just share a screen here. So if you want to get in touch with either one of our websites, uh, we will also put this screen up at the end, but uh, mm -hmm. our website is Communion with God Ministries. And uh, since we're talking about inner healing, if you add prayers to the end of that website, it'll take you to our section on prayers that heal the heart. Mm -hmm. And then Dr. Carl Lehman's website is emmanuelapproach.com. And he has written two very outstanding and thick books. Uh, first book <laughs> here is Outsmarting Yourself, uh, 350 pages, yeah, 380 pages. And then uh, if you want some heavy duty reading, uh, The <laughs> Emanual Approach, 750 pages, all right? And it's not exactly light reading. I just want you to know that you know, <laughs> it will stretch your brain and, and may get a little bit tired from time to time, but I've enjoyed both books. So thank you very much. <laughs> uh, all right. So what we're going to do is I'm going to share a little bit about inner healing as I've experienced it, as I practice it. And uh, then we're going to, I'm going to ask Dr. Carl if he will go ahead and share inner healing as he practices it. Uh, we've both been doing it probably for 30 or 40 years. Uh, he tells me he's done it since he, since, um, since he was at home with his parents, I guess, right? Is, is that correct, Dr. Carl? <laughs> well, I was learning about it, watching my dad do it. And I started doing it myself in medical school with my, okay. with my patients. So I've been doing it for about 35 years, but I've been watching it for 50. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Well, I learned about this uh, maybe 35 years ago or so from Rita Bennett and uh, been using it in, in our book, uh, Prayers to Heal the Heart. I didn't actually have a copy of the book, but what I've got is just some videos. Uh, and we are, that book was written about 30 years ago, and now we are rewriting it. And it's at the publishers. It'll come out April 1st from Bridge Logos. It'll be Prayers to Heal the Heart Revised, which will be an expanded version of what I'm going to try to say in about 15 minutes. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Carl and let him tell us what he would like to add from the field of brain science and how he uses it as a, a certified, board certified psychologist. Am I correct? Psychiatrist. 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 That's Psychiatrist. That, that has the MDP. So that's medical school and then specializing in psychiatry whereas a psychologist is the graduate school but no md okay sounds good psychiatrist i apologize so all right so tr resolving trauma in our lives through inner healing prayer um i think this definition of inner healing i probably got from rita bennett um or at least i condensed it from her it's allowing god to replace the pictures in the art gallery of my mind removing any picture that doesn't have Jesus in it and replacing it with a picture that does. So for me, it is primarily about pictures, which I understand to be right brain. I was going to ask you, Dr. Carl, do you see picture, picturing and visualizing as a right brain function or do you see it differently than that? Um, so the real short answer is mostly yes. And the slightly longer answer is uh, every discussion I've ever heard of brain science is, is oversimplified because <laughs> Because uh, to, to a big extent, you know, the, your visual cortex is in the back and it's on both sides. But there is um, processing of emotional and kind of experiential memory stuff is dominant on the right side. So that's, it's, that's mostly accurate. Okay, well, good. I think we're comfortable with that then. That's fine. And, and I agree. There's a lot of uh, back and forth dialogue between the hemispheres for sure. So uh, <clears throat> and sometimes we're picturing a lie. And uh, so in inner healing, we're moving from picturing from a picture that contains a lie, which is that Jesus wasn't present when this trauma happened in my life, to a picture that portrays the truth, which is Jesus obviously was present. And any picture in my mind must have Jesus in it to be a legitimate 
true picture, biblically speaking, because Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us. And uh, if I'm not picturing that reality and picturing he wasn't there, I am picturing a lie. And it's going to take me backward, not forward. Pictures are the language of the heart, I believe. The Bible talks about the imagination of the heart, and so it puts a visual capacity in the heart on numerous occasions. And it seems to me like if I want to heal the heart, I'm going to have to work with the language of the heart, which does include pictures. Um, Second Corinthians is very clear to say we're transformed while we look, while we look. So um, while we look not at things which are seen, but things which are not seen. So we're looking into the spirit world, um, and when we look in the spirit world, we're seeing something that transforms us. So what's my question is, what do I see in the spirit world that transforms me from fear to faith or from anger to love? And um, what I would see was Jesus, fixing my eyes on Jesus. Here's an example of God using the eyes of Abram's heart, the father of faith. He says, look towards the heavens, count the stars. This isn't a dream now. If you're able to number them, he said, so shall your descendants be. And then... Abram believed in the Lord. First mentioned that Abram believed. Now, I know he did believe at some, to some level, but he believed at a deeper level, and God commented on the deeper level of faith that came when he saw a picture in his mind of the promise of his destiny fulfilled. Mm -hmm. So pictures are very powerful, and they can generate faith to move us forward. Um, we say a picture is worth a thousand words. And so Abraham saw a vision of thousands of stars, increased his faith level, cemented his faith. And um, as far as I'm concerned, that verse there in Genesis 15, 5 and 6 would confirm to me what we say a picture is worth a thousand words. And if I want to heal the heart, I've got to heal the pictures that I'm looking at. Wrong pictures mess me up. It says, Jeremiah 7, they hearken not nor incline their ear. They walked in the counsel and imagination of an evil heart. This is King James Bible, all right? So if I take my visual capacity um, and I use it to picture evil, I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to move into fear, doubt, anger, hostility, abandonment, you name it. I'm going backwards. And if I'm using my visual capacity with a pure heart and seeing what God is showing me, I'm going to go forward. So there's no such thing as being neutral here. There's no such thing as, well, I think I'll just skip picturing. You're not going to skip picturing. I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to be, I'm always picturing something. And the Bible is very clear to say in the New Testament, we fix our eyes on Jesus. That is the only place the New Testament tells us to fix our eyes. So as far as I'm concerned, if Jesus is not in the scene I'm looking at, then I'm not honoring New Testament mandate, which is to have my eyes fixed on Jesus because he is Emmanuel. Mm -hmm. King David says, Acts 2, he said, he said, I behold the Lord at my right hand. So he's, uh, he's picturing him right there next to him. He's quoting Psalm 16, 8, where he says, I have set the Lord at my right hand. So this is visualizing. He didn't say I got a vision. I set the Lord. He's taking the eyes of his heart. He's picturing God with him. So I can look at my right hand and I can say, well, I, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing there's nobody there. Now, I believe in my head that God's Emmanuel, God with me. So I got a left brain logical belief he's with me, but I'm picturing he's not. So my question is, I'm at discord on the inside. One part of me says I'm a believer. The other part of me says, no, what you believe isn't true because I don't see that reality. So with that kind of discord, my chance of moving forward with any sort of unity or power or passion or healing is thwarted because I'm at discord. My, what I believe linearly, linearly does not agree with what I'm picturing. So as long as I got to picture something, I'm not gonna picture empty air at my right hand. I'm gonna picture Jesus at my right hand. It doesn't take any more energy to picture Jesus here than it does to picture empty air. And empty air, if I'm picturing that, it's an evil imagination. It does not line up with scripture. If I picture Jesus here, it's a godly imagination. It does line up with scripture. And those are the only two choices I have, evil or godly. And then the really exciting thing that I learned many years ago, <clears throat> the emotions that I have are guided by the pictures I'm gazing at. So if I'm imagining, let's say my wife, she didn't, she's two hours late coming home and I'm picturing, oh my gosh, something horrible happened. She's in an accident, there's blood on the road, there's ambulance there, there's sirens. 
that picture produces an emotional response, fear, all right? Trauma, terror. Now, if I asked Jesus for a picture and said, Lord, you know, what's going on with my wife? Why is she two, two, two hours late? And I, a picture lights up on my mind. Now, flowing pictures that light up on my mind are visions from God because flow is the Holy Spirit within, the river within that's flowing. So I'm asking God for a picture. A picture pops into my mind, which is a vision from God. And there, sure enough, look at there's an angel sitting there in the hood of the car having a fun time while they're stuck in traffic. And guess what? That produces an emotional response of peace and joy. So I discovered years ago that I can guide the emotions I'm feeling by carefully selecting the pictures I look at. So divide a godly imagination will define as picturing things God says are so. And our visionary capacity is for the purpose of receiving dreams at night from God, visions during the day, and picturing biblical truths. If God says a thing is a certain way, picture it that way. Don't picture the opposite. So why I do need inner healing is because, number one, Jesus, as Emmanuel, he was present when this hurt happened. They'll say, on a dairy farm years ago, my dad said something to me and came out and it wounded me deeply. And uh, so, so okay, so I, am a, I wasn't picturing. Number two, I didn't see Jesus there in the Hema with me. And what number three, to get healed, I need to go back to the scene and see Jesus there with me because he was there with me. He said he was. I mean, David said, if I go to Sheol, you're there. You know, so there's no hell that we walked through that Jesus wasn't there with us. Mm -hmm. And so this is the steps of inner, this is what we do with inner healing. So the steps taken, number one, using vision, I go back and I re-enter the herd. I'll go back to a dairy farm. There we are in the hay mile. There's dad, there's me. And uh, using vision, I'm going to welcome Jesus into the scene and say, Jesus, I know you were there. Just show me where you were. And I'm going to look with a smile on my face. The picture is going to light up on my mind, which is a vision of Jesus with me. And then number three, using vision, I'm going to invite Jesus to move freely and I'm going to, going to tune to flow, flowing thoughts, which will be his voice, flowing vi visions, pictures, which will be his vision. And I'll be having a two-way communication with God where he's present as the wonderful counselor, giving me wonderful counsel and healing me. And the biblical example of that, of course, would be <clears throat> Peter when he denied Jesus three times around a charcoal fire in early dawn and uh, went out and wept bitterly because he realized he just blew his life up. He just cursed and swore and said, I don't, don't even know Jesus. So obviously to him, there's no chance Jesus could ever use him again. Mm -hmm. But Jesus needs to heal that. So number two, Jesus, uh, he resets the scene. It's a charcoal fire again in John chapter 21. It's a threefold confession. Peter, do you love me? And the one difference is, and, and it's, it's already done. So it completely restructures a scene. But the difference is Jesus is there saying, hey, I love you. I accept you. Go, go feed the sheep, go feed the sheep. It's, you're not out of the ministry, go take care of the sheep, you're fine. It's a learning curve mistake, no big deal. Mm -hmm. So that's inner healing, uh, letting, going back to the scene, letting Jesus show up and move freely through flowing thoughts and flowing pictures. I don't think I have to re-traumatize myself. I don't think <clears throat> Jesus re-traumatized -tra Peter and said, you have to feel all that trauma that you felt and go and weep bitterly. He just said, I just want you to be present and I want you to see the scene clearly this time. I'm there loving you, smiling, accepting you and saying, hey, I don't care how weak you are, how badly you mess up, it's no problem, I love you. I'm giving, I've given my life for you, it's okay. So how do I identify these, these scenes that need to be healed? I don't go digging, you know, saying, hey God, you know, uh, I don't say, Mark, try to figure out, you know, 10 different events that need healing. I go to the Lord. And I say, Lord, what negative pictures of people or even experiences am I holding, which are contributing to the heart wound that I'm dealing with today, which could be anger, hatred, fear, abandonment, lust, you name it. So I'm going to tune to flow and I'm going to list down the left column, which I'll show you in the next PowerPoint. And I'm only going to use three words to describe the scene. Approximate age. Okay. I was, I was 12. I was in the Hema with dad. Okay. Four, four words. Okay. Or here we are age seven, kitchen and mom. And the reason I just want three words, I don't want to be re-traumatized. And my healing doesn't come by going back through the story line by line and feeling all the anger and hatred and rage again. That's not what heals me. What heals me is Jesus stepping in, saying and doing something. That's what heals. So 
we're going to minimize this part, which is the left column, the painful scenes. There's a chance to list seven different painful scenes that Jesus might light upon your mind just three words per scene. And then on the right column, we're gonna do inner healing prayer where we say, Jesus, I know you were there. So would you step into that scene show, and show up and tell me what you were doing, show me what you were doing. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to limit yourself to go to those couple lines. You can take out half a sheet of paper and, and write out more of what Jesus is saying and doing. So if you're working on this on your own, I would say when <clears throat> begin with the least intense scene, work your way up to the more intense scenes. Uh, second bullet point, uh, tune to flowing thoughts, flowing pictures, and write down what you're getting. <clears throat> Third point, don't manipulate the scene yourself and say, well, I think I want Jesus to do this. You don't have to tell Jesus what to do. You just want to watch what he is doing. He's alive. Mm -hmm. Don't have to make him come alive. He already is alive. And to connect with him, I normally have to put a big smile on my face because <laughs> I'm a workaholic enough to grunt about everything I do. Um, and grunting does not precipitate the flow of the Holy Spirit within me. Ceasing my labors. The best way for me to cease my labors is a big smile on my face because I can't be grunting and smiling at the same time. So, so for me, I put a big smile on my face. And for my clients, when I work with them, I say, put a big smile on your face as you look around for Jesus. Because it postures them internally properly to get over their own efforts so that the flow can bubble up within them. And we'll need to choose to forgive, honor, release, and bless the person who maybe wounded us, who did wound us in that situation, or even an animal um, could wound us. I remember John Arnott in Toronto had a lady on stage. He was showing healing. And this lady had a hip problem because her, her favorite horse that she was riding fell, slipped and fell, landed on her hip, crushed it. And she had been to the hospital for surgeries for years and couldn't get over the pain. And so John asked her, well, have you forgiven the horse? <laughs> and she hadn't. So she forgave the horse and instantly on the stage, she was healed of the pain in her hip. So the He's Lord is going to be leading us in forgiveness prayers towards people, events, and things. And, and that's crucial. Forgive everything against everyone so that your prayers can be answered, the Bible says. So we follow the Lord's lead in whatever he's asking us to do. For a rape situation, we would not go back to the center of that. We would go back to after it was over and bring Jesus in there at that point in time. Now, if I'm praying with a client, <clears throat> I'm going to be coaching them. Now, the way I've set up prayers to heal the heart is you can do, mo you can do basically all of this on, on your own. Uh, the seventh prayer in the series, which comes after inner healing prayer, is deliverance. And we would recommend that you get someone to pray with you for deliverance. But So for most of this stuff, you can do it on your own. But if I'm working with the person, coaching them, I'm going to memorize the statement below. As, they, as, as I've asked them, I said, now look around and, and see if you can see Jesus. And they'll say, oh, I see him. He's, he's in the kitchen right there. I'm going to say, that's good. <laughs> now, by saying that, I'm affirming in faith that they just got a vision from God. I'm lifting their faith level. So that's good. Now I'm going to coach them. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Tune to flowing thoughts and flowing pictures and tell me what Jesus does next. And the reason I say that is because people don't know to do that. Mm -hmm. They stop looking at Jesus and they start looking someplace else. And that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says fixing your eyes on Jesus. So I'm going to be very intentional about making sure they stay postured properly. All right, keep your eyes on Jesus. Tune to flowing thoughts. They don't know how to do that. If the left brain, if I'm working with the left brain, they're going to start thinking. And that's not, that's not it because our thoughts aren't his thoughts. So I'm not going to let them start thinking because I'm going to coach them. I mean, I'm going to say this 20 times in a, in a five to 10 minute prayer time. I mean, after everything they're telling me, I'm going to say, that's good. Now keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Now tune to flowing thoughts and flowing pictures and tell me what he does next. And um, while I'm saying that, I'm writing out the last thing they just told me that Jesus was doing. And then I go silent for a few seconds. Uh, they look uh, for vision and they say, okay, now Jesus is coming and he's, and they describe what he's doing. And I just repeat the same sentence. That's good. <laughs> I'm starting to write while I'm saying that. I'm going to write down what they just told me. That's good. Now keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, tune to flowing thoughts, flowing pictures, and tell me what Jesus does next. I am very intentional about being a very intentional coach to make sure people know what I believe they need to do to make this work. And I know flowing thoughts come from the river within, the river of the Holy Spirit, John 7, 37. It's Jesus' voice. 
I know flowing visions come from the river within. I know his rhemas are spirit and life and the flesh profits nothing. So I don't want them thinking because there's no benefit in that. I want them tuned to flow and receiving a rhema word from God. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So in my prayer counseling time, it's all divine encounter, 100%. From beginning to end, it's me leading them into an encounter with Jesus and them having an encounter with Jesus. Um, and, and we'll probably go through five to seven to eight different scenes. We'll do that in 30 minutes or so or 40 minutes. Um, and it's all going to be Jesus and them in interaction and me giving them this one. The only thing I have to do is take that one sentence and repeat it over and over and over and write. And when it's all done, give them the notes to take home to review. So I love it. It's 100% prayer. It's 100% Jesus in action. It's 0% me in action other than memorizing one simple paragraph. And then once you're healed, <clears throat> you need to only look at the new picture that Jesus gave you. And never go back to the old lying scene. Because if I go back and gaze at the old picture, the wound reemerges and the emotions of pain come back. Uh, maybe a, one example of that, my wife Patty, her, her mom died a few years ago and her mom was a very noble lady. And um, her last few months, she was in a, in a nursing home, she was in a hospital and hospice care. And last time Patty saw her, she was wrinkled up in bed, maybe 83 pounds, tremendous pain. And, and that was a horrific picture to be left in Patty's mind as the last picture of her mom. And whenever she looked at that, it produced tremendous pain in Patty's heart. And so within two days, Patty said, Lord, <laughs> could you step into this scene and give me a better picture to look at? Because this picture I'm looking at is producing emotional trauma. And she turned to flow and into her mind drifts a picture of Jesus, of, of her mom in heaven with her dad, who had died years earlier. Uh, they were in a grassy field, uh, prime of their life. Her dad had a full head of hair. Her mom had the biggest smile on her face that Patty had ever seen. And they were dancing together in the field. Now the church that her mom and dad went to didn't, didn't allow dancing down here, but up in heaven, <laughs> there's a little bit more freedom than there is sometimes down here. And that new picture just removed all the pain and all the trauma because now she could celebrate because her mom, she saw her mom celebrating. And Patty said, look, as long as I look at that picture, I'm fine. There's no pain. But if I go back and look at the other picture, the pain reemerges. Mm -hmm. So she said, whenever you tell the story, make sure to tell people they need to look at the new picture and not the old one. Mm -hmm. And Dennis and Matt Lynn, they gave me this definition of healing, which I love. <clears throat> A hurt is healed when you can see the gift that God's produced in your life through the experience. Mm -hmm. So then you're going to close out by journaling and say, Lord, what's the gift you produce? Because he said, I worked everything out for good. So I don't care what pain we've walked through, there is good. I mean, I couldn't hear God's voice for 10 years. You talk about pain. I backslid three times. I was so mad I couldn't stand anything. Myself, mm -hmm. God, the church, or anything, you know? Well, the gift is I've now taught well over a million people how to hear God's voice. So, mm -hmm. so in the midst of all that pain is a gift. And uh, if I can see that gift and celebrate that gift, then I'm happy as a lark. If I go back and live in the pain of those 10 years and I'm angry and bitter and mean and mad and saying, God, why did you take 10 whole years to, to make me learn this very simple lesson that your voice is flowing spontaneous thoughts? Why couldn't anybody have ever said that? I could live in anger and bitterness over that, but I don't. I, instead, I just make sure I say it a thousand times every time I open my mouth so that anyone who touches me will know how easy it is to hear the voice of God. And they will not have to walk through 10 years of pain like I did. Okay, I think that is it. So Dr. Carl, I'm going to stop sharing this. I'm going to turn this back over to you. Would you talk to us about inner healing as you see it, as you minister it, as you experience it, and what you might add to what I'm doing that could maybe improve or, or give me some additional pieces? Yeah, well, for, first of all, I'm just so struck by how many similarities there are with what you do and what I do. I call what I do Emmanuel Prayer, and that's Emmanuel God with us. And the reason I name it that, Charlotte and I named it that, is because the center of it, just like Mark describes, the whole pro the, the key emphasis at the beginning, middle, end of the whole process is help the person connect with Jesus, coach them, focus on Jesus, ask him for guidance and help, tell me what happens, that the living presence of Jesus is the center and the foundation for the whole process. So that, that's just like, such a profound similarity, which is just striking to me. So um, 
just uh, a general perspective for the people, uh, all the March people watching or anybody else who might see this. One thing I want to name is there's, you know, maybe, I don't know how many different approaches to emotional healing prayer. Um, you know, in secular world, there's different approaches to therapy. And in, in the Christian world, there's many different ministries who do emotional healing, inner healing. They, they basically um, ask Jesus to help heal psychological trauma. And, and my observation is that pretty much all, of, all the ones I'm aware of share about 80% the same. I mean, the, the, the core principles are the same as far as um, a person comes in and says, you know, I have a problem. I have a, an addiction. I have a problem with anxiety. I have a problem with anger. I have a problem with depression. I have a problem with panic sex. I have a phobia. Whenever the weather gets bad, I, I have panic attacks. And what we discover so often is, oh, underneath that problem in the present, there's an old painful memory that hasn't been resolved. The reason that person has a panic attack when the weather gets bad is because they have a memory of being seven years old and a tornado came to their farm, took their house away, almost killed them. And, oh, what do you know? They're connected. So every one of those healing ministries I'm aware of kind of has the, the, the common understanding. A lot of problems in the present are fueled by, are rooted in old traumatic memories from the past. And if we find that traumatic memory, and then work with Jesus to heal it, that problem in the present will, will resolve. It's like that, that foundational concept of, oh, problems often come from old trauma. And if we go to the traumatic memory and the person works with Jesus in the traumatic memory to get healing, you'll have resolution. And like that, that real core of like the most basic understanding of the whole phenomena, every Christian healing ministry I'm aware of shares that, that common ground. And the reason it's important just to kind of to name what I'm going to talk about now is that I often hear people say, well, they're all pretty much the same. You know, just, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't really matter. Just find somebody close to you um, or anybody, you know, even on the internet over Zoom. You know, just pick one. It doesn't make much difference. They're all pretty much the same. You know, just if they, if they recognize you, you have a traumatic memory and you have to work with Jesus to heal it, you're good, which is sort of true. I mean, the, the, the true part of that is if they have that component, they help you find the traumatic memory and they help you connect with Jesus in the memory and you work with Jesus to get healing, you will get healing and the problem anchored in the memory will resolve or at least improve. You know, sometimes there's splinters left behind, but you, you'll get some good improvement. That part is true. But the piece, the 20%, like so maybe 80% is common ground, but there's I don't know, you know, 20%, 15%, 25% that's variable between the different ministries. And I think it's, it's useful to look at that and I'll give you some examples. There are a lot of ministries um, where the facilitator, the, the minister, whatever you wanna call the person who's leading the ministry, they kind of lead the process for much of the session. You know, they are kind of leading the process for what do we wanna work on? You, you come to me and you say, hey, I have a problem with anxiety. And that person, the facilitator, they're kind of leading and thinking, well, where might that come from? They ask a lot of questions. They help you kind of go look where you might, might where that might be. They lead the process of finding the underlying memory. Okay, focus on your painful emotion. Notice, I mean, there's different techniques you can use. When you find a memory, they lead the process of like identifying specific healing targets in that memory experience. Oh, let's look for and see if we can identify um, false negative perceptions. Let's find the lies that are anchored in that memory. Let's identify uh, are there any, is there demonic infection? Is there bitterness? And even when they uh, then find a healing target, they'll kind of lead the process of kind of focusing on it and preparing it for healing work. And only when they have all those pieces lined up, then they'll say, okay, Jesus, would you please come with healing? Now, and, and that does work. Uh, but the, uh, with that model, one is that the facilitator, the facilitator has to bring, oh, and, and one more piece, there's ministries also that even when you have all the pieces lined up and you ask Jesus to kind of be a part of the healing process, some models also, um, the facilitator or the minister, a part of the, healing, a, a part of the healing intervention is they will receive prophetic truth or words or you know, they'll speak God's truth to you. Um, the minister or facilitator is kind of the intermediary and they will uh, speak God's words of truth or whatever. They kind of speak on God's behalf to the person who's receiving. And for people who really do have prophetic gifts and they have them and they're clean and they know the difference between triggering and their own content and prophecy, and that can sometimes get tangled up. 
uh, that, mo that model does work some of the time, but here's a couple points that are significant. It requires the minister or the facilitator to bring a lot of skill, knowledge, and gifting. And there are a lot of people, especially lay people, if, if we want this ministry to spread around the world, if we want millions of lay people, uh, the reality is there are not enough mental health professionals who know these tools to go around, especially you go to the countries where they have the most trauma, they have the least resources. If we wait for you know, mainstream therapists to care for the people in Uganda that were tra traumatized by Idi Amin or Rwanda, or I mean, it's not gonna happen. If we're, if we're thinking, hey, we need millions of lay people to be able to use simple tools to help people get healing with Jesus. If you have a model that requires a facilitator to bring a lot of skill and gifting and, and um, knowledge, understanding, training, skill, gifting, that's gonna just be much less transferable. And another piece for the models where, you know, you might go through three quarters of the session where the facilitator is leading and the, the minister and the recipient are kind of working together to do all this work. Well, they spend most of the session rummaging around in the, tra in the traumatic memory without the presence of Jesus. And you still do get healed at the end some of the time, but that's a lot more work. It's a lot more painful. It's a lot more draining. It's more intimidating. If people do that and they realize it's kind of like getting your tooth drilled with old technology where the Novocaine wasn't as good and the drills weren't as, and it's like, you'd still get your cavity drilled and, and repaired, but it wasn't very pleasant. And, and the result of that is there'll be a lot of resistance. You know, if you have a process, even if it works, if it's exhausting and scary and painful, you'll be much less willing to go back and do more. And that's another, that's, that's costly because we, we wanna communicate, hey people, we all have painful memories that affect us. We all need healing. And it's not that big of a deal. You can go with Jesus through the process. He'll be right beside you. When he's in the middle of it, it's, a, it's surprisingly not bad. If people have a gentle experience, they're going to be much more likely to do it. They're going to be more likely to share it. They're going to be more likely to bring their friends. They're going to be more likely, more likely they'll be more willing as a lay person to facilitate for their kids, for their spouse, for their friends, for their family, for their church. So it's, it's, um, it's a significant difference if you have a model where Jesus is uh, right at the beginning, you connect with Jesus, and then the whole process, okay, focus on Jesus, ask him for guidance and help, tell me what happens. If Jesus is the one who brings the knowledge and the skill and the gifting, the facilitator, you can have a lay person beginner, you can go to Africa and have, you know, we, a team I trained did this, and you have volunteers from the nearby village, 23 years old, they have a third grade education, and they can still do, can you see Jesus? Focus on Jesus, ask him for guidance and help, and tell me what happens. If you have a simple model where Jesus brings the, the knowledge, the skill, and the gifting, it's much more transfer, it's much more transferable. It's, it's much more accessible. And in the real world, that's kind of a big deal. And then again, that piece of uh, the less time they spend in the painful memory by themselves, the gentler the process will be the less intimidating it will be. And also there's less risk of re-traumatizing the person, um, especially if we have lay ministers and you spend a lot of time rummaging around in a traumatic memory and, and kind of really connect with it intensely. And especially if you get stuck and you don't have the skill and tools to troubleshoot, you can actually re-traumatize people. You take them into a bad place and you can't get back out and they spend a bunch of time there and you say, okay, well, gosh, let's pray and go home. And uh, that person can have a, the whole week can be bad. It'll affect their parenting. It'll affect their marriage. And just medically, neurologically, you can actually re-traumatize them. So again, you know, the, the models that do it, other, there are models that um, they still work and they have 80% that's similar, but that difference about Jesus being the, in the center right at the beginning, you depend on him and they don't spend time in the bad memory without Jesus, that difference, uh, both models will still work, at least some of the time, but if it's gentler, easier, more transferable, safer, those are significant differences that are worth, that to me, it's worth using some discernment. Hey, let's find a healing model that has those attributes that make a real significant difference in the real world.
So kind of just naming that, there's a, there's a number of pieces that Dr. Mark's model and my own do include that. Right at the beginning, you connect with Jesus, all through the process, focus on Jesus, ask him for guidance and help. He's gonna lead, he's gonna bring the gifting and you don't spend time in the bad memory without Jesus. So, and there's some other, there's some other ones, someday we'll have time to discuss more details, but those are a couple examples just to illustrate um, that 20, 25% difference between models, it's worth looking at because it does make a difference that's, I think, significant in the real world. So kind of naming that, that's, I think, uh, it's a, a part of the big picture that's good to be aware of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I want to touch on some fun pieces that, like the model Dr. Mark described, I used that model for 20 years. I mean, that, you know, actually, it wasn't even as good as his. I, I had um, earlier forms, or I mean, I had one of the other models that we spent more time in this in the traumatic memory without Jesus. I spent more time leading, and it still worked, but it had all those caught. It, uh, it was lacking the value of those pieces that Dr. Mark's model uses, my model uses now. And in recent years, especially in, con in uh, working closely with Dr. Jim Wilder, fascinating, we've applied some brain science. And it, it was interesting because we started with the brain science and we said, okay, now if this is how the brain works. If we deliberately apply that in our healing model, what if we did this? And here's an example. Um, there's, a, there's a part of your brain that God designed to do relationships. You know, we're, we're relational beings. God designed us to be in relationship with God's self and with each other. And good design feature, there's a big chunk of your brain whose job it is to be the neurological hardware for relationships. Now, the bad news is certain conditions can kind of turn that part of your brain off. If you get overwhelmed by negative emotions or if you get triggered and kind of get stuck, if you get triggered back to and connect with the emotions from, a, from an old traumatic memory, that'll turn your relational circuits off. So if, you're, if your relational circuits are off, it's really hard to connect emotionally with other people and with God. Now, the good news is, once again, understanding the way the brain works, there are simple interventions that you can deliberately turn the relational circuits on. And one of those simplest, one of the simplest interventions is to help a person feel appreciation. The way the brain is wired is if you feel appreciation, it will turn your relational circuits on. It's impossible to feel appreciation and have your relational circuits off at the same time. So if you notice your relational circuits are off and you deliberately focus on positive content and stir up appreciation, if you, if you can get to the point where you actually feel appreciation, your relational circuits will come back on. And in applying more brain science, we say, okay, and one of the most powerful ways to get to that appreciation place is actually to go back and reconnect with a positive memory. Uh, just the way, the way a memory, the way your right hemisphere works, um, like just thinking about concrete things. I'm grateful I have a house. I'm grateful I had breakfast this morning. Well, that's true and that's, that's valid and God even tells us to be grateful for those things. But if you actually go, if you close your eyes and you go back inside of, okay, here I am. I'm on a special trip with my wife, Charlotte. We're hiking in the Grand Canyon. It's a beautiful day. And I, I take a few minutes to kind of reconnect with that positive memory. That's a particularly simple and powerful way to get that, get that appreciation stirred up. So the, we thought, well, what if we started a healing prayer session with helping a person connect with a positive memory and it would get their relational circuits on, so it would make their brain, it, it, um, it would prepare their brain to connect with God. I mean, if, if we're right about the theory, if they start with a positive memory, feeling appreciation, getting their relational circuits on, it would be easier to find and connect with Jesus. And here's the funny part. Neither we were like, well, is that a lie? Can you do that? I mean, I had I had never done that. I was totally familiar with let's find the bad, let's find the traumatic memory. And once we get into the traumatic memory and we put all the pieces together, then we ask Jesus to come with healing. And then the person would perceive Jesus. So I knew all about how to help a person connect with Jesus inside a traumatic memory. It had never occurred to me, well, I don't know. I I'm, maybe it's possible to connect with Jesus in a positive memory. I don't know. I've never tried it. And, and now we look back and we think, this is so silly, of course. I mean, Jesus is always with us. I'll buy with you always. Why on earth would Jesus leave anytime something good happens? Like, but, but as, as humbling as it is, that had never occurred to me. It was just like, so 
We tried it, it's like, well, what do you know? That works fine. So the idea, oh, let's start the session in a gentle way. It's a gentle on-ramp, um, positive memory. And then we would do the little invitation, Jesus, I invite you to be with me here. Help me to perceive your presence. Kind of similar to what Mark does in his listening, in his two-way journaling. And what we discovered is people have a particularly easy time finding and connecting with Jesus in the context of a positive memory where they're feeling gratitude. It's prepared their brain to connect with God's presence. Oh, we put that at the front. It's a very gentle startup. It's an easy on-ramp. It's kind of like putting the Novocaine in before you drill the tooth. So that kind of, oh, that kind of makes sense. And there's another piece of brain science. As Jim and I were kind of thinking, brainstorming together. And we realized, you know, relationships are memory mapped. You know, like, the, uh, your, like my relationship with my wife, Charlotte, that's carried in my memories of our times together. You know, when I meet somebody on the street who I've never met before, I don't have any memories of ever like part of what you say is, well, I don't ever remember seeing that person before. I don't know them. Whereas Charlotte, I remember dating her. I remember going out to dinner. I remember camping trips. I remember working on house repair projects together where she'd, she'd read a fun book and I would repair, you know, repair some part of the house. I have thousands of memories with Charlotte and my memory and my relationship with her are, is carried in those memories. So then we thought, huh, if you like humanly, if you, if I, if Charlotte and I sit down together and we get a photo album out and we deliberately remember, oh, remember that trip when we went to, to the Tetons and we saw that bear and the little cubs or whatever? Oh, yeah, yeah. If you deliberately think about and reconnect with and you're, you're refreshing the neurological circuits that carry that memory. So one is you're, you're getting your brain in a place where it's very easy to reconnect with that person. And you're actually strengthening in your brain, you're strengthening the relationship with the person when you think about and remember good experiences with them. We thought that should, why wouldn't that apply to God? And that like, that works with your wife, that works with your friend. That's the way the brain works with your human friendships. So we thought, huh, for people who have memories of a positive experience of God, the positive memory you start with, what if we start with memories that include a connection of sense of God's presence? We tried that, it works even better. You're actually going to the place in your brain circuits where you kind of carry your memories of God's presence. That's where your relationship with God, it, I mean, it, there's a place that lives in your spirit, but the, but the secular brain science doesn't know how to study that. So what, what we do know is in your biological brain, your relationships is carried in your, in, your, in your memories. If you go and refresh those memories of experiencing God's presence in a good way, that kind of activates the circuits where you carry that relationship and it makes it that much easier to just step into a connection right here in the present. And there's another way in which it kind of makes sense to people. You know, when you, uh, when you activate a memory, you kind of recreate the same conditions that were there. You know, like part of what happens in your brain when you go to a memory is to some extent you recreate the same conditions that were there the first time. Think, oh, if I, re if I recreate the conditions of experiencing God's presence in the past, well, we know those were good conditions because it worked. I mean, the last time it worked. So if you, if you recreate those same conditions, that's another way in which you can prepare, you know, prepare you the way for the Lord. Going to a memory of a good experience of God's presence prepares the way in your brain to reconnect with God in the present. Oh, start a memory, start a healing session, positive memory, ideally if it includes the connection with a perception of God's presence, focus on it and connect with it until you feel grateful you turn your relational circuits on, you activate the place in your brain where you carry your relationship with God, that all prepares the way in your brain. So those are pieces, it's like, it made sense, we tried it, and it's like, wow, it works. So as far as I know, I haven't seen anybody else who had discovered that, but besides Jim and I, we kind of figured that out from the brain science. And the cool part is, it's fairly easy to add. And now there are other ministries that do emotional healing, and they're like, oh, well, we can do that. I mean, it takes five minutes at the beginning, to, um, easy to add that. So here's another cool piece. Not only is that a gentle startup and good brain science, it actually increases the success rate of being able to connect with God's presence at the beginning, but it provides a safety net. And this is a really cool piece. So during the session, 
if anything, you, you run into a problem, you get something, there's some kind of a problem develops, the person gets tangled, they get triggered, they get stuck in bitterness. You're a beginner lay person, you've only done this twice before. If anything happens that you don't know what to do with, you can just say, okay, time out. Let's go back to the positive memory and the connection with Jesus that we just refreshed 14 minutes ago. And since you've just refreshed it and practiced it, it's easy to get back to. And I was sitting there when Mark, when Mark described it. So I, I can even coach him. If, he's, if, he's, um, if he got stuck in the bad memory, he kind of got in there too far and got stuck. I can say, okay, Mark, you just told me about that wonderful time with your uncle. You're sitting by the pond. You're kind of fishing and you're eating, you know, you're eating peanut M&Ms. I can, I can feed to him all the details and kind of coach him. So, okay, I coach him back to the positive memory. Okay, so you're back at the pond. You're with your uncle, blah, blah, blah. Okay, now, and 14 minutes ago when you were in that memory, you were able to sense Jesus' presence there with you. Okay, invite Jesus again, focus on that imagery. It's a beautiful safety net. That, and that doesn't take a board certified psychiatrist to do what I just described. The average lay person can say, okay, Mark, I mean, remember again, the pond, your uncle, fishing, peanut M&Ms. You can learn how to do that in a handful of minutes. I mean, I can, in a weekend seminar, I can explain that to you and you can practice it. And if you have a prayer time and a person kind of gets too deep into the traumatic memory and you're running out of time and they haven't gotten healing, instead of just saying, oh, well, um, help us, God, go home, try not to kill your children and come back next week and hopefully something better will happen. You're running out of time. The person's in a bad place. And you say, okay, before you leave, let's get your paint, let's get your playing back on the ground. You just do the same thing. Okay, let's go back to the positive memory your uncle, the pond, the peanut M&Ms, Jesus is sitting beside you there. And he's looking at your, the, bat, the fish you just caught. He's kind of admiring your, he's like, oh, well done, Mark. Safety net in the middle of the process or at the end, if you run out of time, if you get stuck, you can help the person get their plane back on the ground. And for lay people all over the world, the 23 year old guy in Africa with a third grade education, I can teach him that in a morning. Yeah. So that he, can, he can do this kind of healing prayer with that safety net. And it's that much more transferable and safe for lay people because they have a very simple safety net that dramatically reduces the risk of them getting stuck and saying, hey, I'm a 23 year old volunteer with a third grade education, I don't know what to do. With the simple addition of that one piece, well, a couple of pieces, a positive memory at the beginning, then you teach them how to use it as a safety net. That's a totally like, you can add that. That's another one where any other ministry can add that. You know, with Dr. Mark's model there, it's a small thing. We say, hey, we can just add these little pieces here. And then our lay people that we go to, you know, who to pick anywhere, rural, rural town in Kansas, village in Brazil, we can add that simple little piece. Sweet. And I'm trying to remember what else was there. Uh, actually, let me, let me look at my notes here because there was some other fun piece. The safety net piece we wanted to do, the positive memory, our relationships are carried in memories with God. Okay. If they can't hear God's voice, if they're stuck. Oh, well, yeah, actually, the, 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 I think actually we got all the ones we wanted to do, the simple ones, and then just name something. Uh, you know, Mark talks about, you know, he, he, he coaches a lot of lay people to do this with each other and also to do it on your own with journaling. And my experience as a psychiatrist is that those are, those are really good tools. And like the thing that Mark does of just touch the traumatic memory and then connect with Jesus. That's a very safe, gentle way to do it. But um, like I'm a psychiatrist, so I, I tend to get, uh, if, so, if somebody has a really big problem and they try praying with a lay person or if they try doing it at home, you know, I actually recommend if you have really bad memories, it's ideal to pray with somebody else and not do it by yourself. Because, yep. and here's actually a piece that makes sense to, to the listeners right now, that safety net piece. Uh, if you really get in trouble, you want to have somebody to help you use it. You know, if you get in a little bit of trouble, you can say, oh, oh yeah, safety net. I'm going to go back to the pond with Uncle Bob. But if you're, if you come in for a really bad memory, you've been, you've been assaulted, you're a combat veteran. I mean, if I, if I work with some veteran, they walk into a clearing and they get ambushed. And he blacks out and his next memory is carrying his buddy's body parts in his backpack. That's, that's kind of a deep water memory. 
And you don't want to get stuck in that memory and forget where you are and not even remember that you have a safety net. So in that kind of a scenario, it's useful to have a prayer, like your, if you have a prayer facilitator, they can say, Mark, Mark, okay, I'm, st I'm still here. It's 2021. Okay, look at me, look at me. Okay, I'm going to help you get back to your positive memory. Now, in that kind of deep water work, uh, uh, a very unfortunate example is that there are sadly too many people who've been traumatized by clergy, by pastors. And if somebody has been abused by a pastor in a church, holding a Bible, quoting scripture while he's abusing them. And you start out with, well, let's start out with connecting with Jesus. Sometimes that's bumpy. And, um, and, and those blockages that are kind of in the way are anchored in specific memories. And so like that, uh, in my Big Lion book, there's a, um, one of the things I talk about is in that kind of complex deep water scenario, there can be a, a block of the work where you have to provide more leadership to get rid of those memory anchor blockages so that the person is able to connect with Jesus. And so just not, not time today, but that's like a piece where in the Emmanuel approach, there's a big section of, you know, when you're doing deep water and you have uh, blockages that are anchored in specific memories, there's other tools you want to use to help to be safe and effective to get rid of those blockages. And then as soon as the person connects with Jesus, then you're back to safe and easy. So that was, I think those were the, the pieces I was wanting to touch on there. We, we covered a lot of ground. Um, anything you're thinking of that you wanted me to mention, Mark? No, I think you covered it, covered it all. And uh, I think it's great. And I totally agree that, that what you've shared, well, I agree with everything you've said, okay? And I agree that I can easily add your, the, your pieces to my model, okay? The, on the ramp up, the, the ramp on and the safety net at the end, uh, simple things to add, fully understand them. So I thank you for those because I think they're very beneficial and they will help us and, and those who follow our ministry, it'll help them a lot, I believe. So, and everything else you said, totally in agreement with. So yes, <laughs> thank that's you. Fun. That's fun. That's <laughs> fine. One thing I'll, I would just add, it just occurs to me. So if somebody, if you got Mark's book about the, the, the book he mentioned, and I've read a, on the internet, there was pieces of it that I kind of looked through it. If you read my whole big book about my whole model, if you pay careful attention, you'll notice there's little differences. I mean, there's um, all the important things we share, but there's, there's little differences here and there. It's like, okay, my expectation is over the, over the next years, as Mark and I have conversations, we'll synchronize on some of those, um, but don't let those little differences make too big of a bump. You know, keep your eyes on Jesus and keep your eyes on, wow, there's so much that's similar and that's synchronized and compatible and like all the things we just we just talked about. And like, for example, if when I put this material up on my website or whatever, I'm sure my people will say, well, hey, there's, you know, a couple of things that are a little bit different there, Dr. Carl. And I'm like, yeah, and my observation is both ways work. And let's talk about that. There's a few little details that aren't exactly the same. Let's talk about them. But like my experience is both the models basically work and they're pretty good and that'd be my short summary <laughs> okay well that sounds good i do want to put up uh this uh powerpoint where so if people do want to connect to your website uh, again it's emmanuelapproach.com and there's tons and tons of resources I, I love the resources you have dr carla a lot of video segments where you're actually praying with a person and showing how to use the on-ramp and how to use the safety net and and I've watched those and I thought, well, those are extremely helpful just to watch you do those. So highly recommend people go and watch those and, and begin to read all your thousands of pages that you have up there. So, <laughs> and uh, if you go to my website, you will find our Prayers That Heal the Heart book. Uh, the new version of it uh, will come out April 1st, according to Bridge Logos. And we, and I have videotaped 12 hour, 12 sessions of me teaching through the new version of the book. So. That'll be available, and in May 1st, from our website, we will stream the full 12 hours free. Anybody who gets signed up on our mailing, mailing list, we'll send you a notification on how you can watch me um, teach through the entire book for free. So that'll be available May 1st. So the book on April 1st, the video series on May 1st. And if, if you've got clients who can't hear God's voice, then we have the four keys to hearing God's voice. We actually make that a prerequisite. Uh, if you're going to take the course on prayers that heal the heart in our university which is christian leadership university 
we say if you have to take before that our course called communion with god which which takes people through the through the book on four keys to hearing god's voice so uh, so we just since it's all based on hearing god's voice we want to make sure that they're able to do that um, in fact mark mark what you just said there you just reminded me the second safety net okay so the, first, the first safety net you put the positive memory in place and if you get in trouble you can go back to it and our second safety net is exactly what mark just described if you're not able to connect with Jesus in a positive memory, you don't do you don't do trauma work. Just, just how Pat, how Dr. Mark said, a, prerequ a prerequisite for the healing work is you have to be able to hear God's voice. For us, the second safety net is you don't do any trauma work unless you can connect with Jesus in a positive memory. So that's no another part where I looked at your stuff and said, oh, that um, that second safety net you kind of have in place there already. Yes. Just the way you do that yourself. And I'm like that we do the exact same thing for and um, and there's cool brain science behind it, in addition to other good principles. So sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you by Oh, that you just reminded me the second station <laughs> I forgot to mention. And you do the exact same thing. Okay, well, that sounds good. So it's one more place point of compatibility, uh, compatibility, which is great to see. And, uh, you know, we I, we guarantee that our training on the four keys hearing God's voice will work. Okay, we've We've taken eight and a half thousand students through the course Community of God in our university. We have a money back guarantee with the course. If you can't hear God's voice at the end of it, you can ask for a full refund. And out of the eight and a half thousand people, three have actually asked for a refund. And I've called all three up and said, did you actually use the four keys? And all three of them said, nope. I said, which one didn't you use? Oh, the vision one. It sounded too new agey to me. And I said, well, you know what? You've proven if you don't use the four keys, it doesn't work. You want to just try all four just to see, you know? No, I'm too afraid. So three people have got their money back because they wouldn't use the four keys, but but we have a, I mean, Jesus guaranteed my sheep hear my voice. So as long as he guaranteed it, I can guarantee it. And uh, and, and we have now eight and a half thousand people who have been through the course, who did hear God's voice with basically the 99.999% success rate. The only ones that failed are those who wouldn't use the four keys. So we do have a tool that we guarantee will work very, very effectively. So that is my gift to the body of Christ and that particular book of ours outsells all the 50 books I've written put together so God's anointing and call and destiny is obviously on that book and that's our primary message to teach the body of Christ mm -hmm. so I think hey, man. that's good <laughs> I know you and I wondered if we'd have time to talk about joy at all do we want to save that for another session do you want to say a word or two about that before we close an, app an appetizer Okay, so, good. <laughs> for the, the people watching, this is cool. Um, joy is in the Bible. I mean, love, it talks about huge. God is love. If you abide in love, you abide in God, and God abides in you. Love, I mean, love is real easy to spot. You got to be totally blind and not spot love. And if you look for it, you realize there's joy in there is important. You know, I, that your joy may be full. There's places where you can find joy. What's cool is we now understand the brain science of joy. And there's a way there's 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 practical things you can learn uh the, and 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 the way that joy works relationally in brain science is when you see somebody's face light up when you walk in the room when you can see that you have the sparkle in their, their eye like when mark the video came on this morning i saw mark's face my immediate involuntary response i noticed it as like my face lit up like, hey mark good morning that response i'm glad to see you and i can see you're glad to see me that actually produces the joy in your brain. We can teach you how to do that and it will bless every relationship in your life.